A very warm welcome to all of you uh, to this uh, new journal club brought to you by the International Academy for Clinical Hematology. Uh, I'm Mohamed Moti from the St. Autonomous in France, and it is my great pleasure to moderate uh, this uh, journal club uh, uh, today. And uh, the uh, chosen uh, paper uh, for uh, this uh, journal uh, club is a recent uh, paper uh, by Dr. Uh, D'Agostino and colleagues, uh, and the paper is entitled Predictors of Unsustained Measurable Residual Disease Negativity in Patient with Multiple Myeloma. And I must confess that the steering committee was very puzzled with this title initially because usually we focus on the value of uh, MRD negativity. And here it turned out it was the other way around and our Italian uh, colleagues, uh, you will see did a great job actually trying to identify and predict those patients who will achieve MRD negativity, but will lose it rather quickly. And I believe this is a critical issue in our practice because this is likely the group of patients where maybe we would need to establish different treatment approaches. So, here are uh, the here is the summary of uh, the paper, and actually, this is a so-called ancillary study uh, based on the multicenter uh, randomized, uh, which was reported uh, previously by uh, Dr. Francesca uh, Gay and colleagues. And we are very honored, actually, uh, to have uh, today with us uh, Dr. Francesca Gay, who is the senior author of uh, this paper published in Blood. And the other panelist is Dr. Hira Mayan uh, from Hamilton in Canada, who is also uh, one of the uh, top experts in uh, this field. And uh, here, uh, the colleagues uh, performed by multi-parameter flow cytometry using the uh, 10 minus 5 threshold. Uh, they performed MRD uh, at time of pre-maintenance treatment, and we'll discuss the design of the trial in a few minutes, but every uh, six months uh, after. And uh, they actually could show a clear uh, negative impact, I would say, on amplification 1Q, but also gain of 1Q on the probability of unsustained MRD negativity compared to those patients with a normal uh, 1Q. We have the same story when you consider the number of high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities, one is better than two, and zero is better uh, than one and two. Interestingly, because this is not done in routine practice, they could also look into the circulating uh, tumor cells, and I believe we need to uh, discuss this issue. Uh, the kinetics, the time to achieving first MRD uh, negativity pre or post consolidation also plays an important role. And I believe this probably has to do with the uh, disease biology. Uh, last but not least, I think an important uh, uh, feature uh, is related to the type of maintenance that we use uh, post-induction and post-transplant if patients are undergoing transplant. 
because actually we do have a proof of concept, for instance, here that using a doublet uh, maintenance is proving to be more beneficial, I would say. And here it was carfizumib, lenalidomide versus lenalidomide alone when it comes to the probability of unsustained MRD uh, and negativity. And this is very interesting because you may remember that recently uh, we've seen uh, the uh, published results of the so-called Perseus trial, which has used in one of its arm uh, a doublet maintenance with daratumumab and lenalidomide. So this story of uh, doublet maintenance is uh, becoming, uh, I would say, a matter of importance. So I'll stop here and I'll start the discussion with our uh, distinguished panelist. And as usual, uh, the first question uh, goes to uh, you, Hira, because you did not participate uh, to this uh, study and publication. And I would like to have your general feeling and maybe your uh, the key messages you could glean uh, from this study, you know, when you've seen the publication. Thank you, Dr. Moti. Um, and thank you to the whole team for this incredibly important publication. So, you know, when I read this study, I think there's kind of three main important points that came out to me. The number one being that overall, actually, patients are doing incredibly well. So this is for TAY trial after a median follow-up of greater than 50 months. And the majority of patients, you know, again, are still in MRD negative status. So that's just speaks to the progress, again, that we're making in multiple myeloma in general, which is just, you know, overall nice to see. And then I think the second point for me was, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we make a patient MRD negative? But I think we're increasingly learning it's not about that one time point. It's not just about how do I make my patient MRD negative at X time point? It's about how do I keep them in that status? And this is really one of the first analyses that I've seen, which really talks about, you know, when I have a patient in my clinic, they're MRD negative. Who are the patients that I really need to think about? Well, I really have to watch this person closely because they may, you know, they have a high chance of losing that MRD negative status that at the moment is making me happy, but may not be long lasting. And then I think the third point I'd like to highlight is just the importance of academic studies. And you know, kudos to your group uh, uh, for really conducting this study. The importance of evaluating translational outcomes, academic trials, because only then can we ask these super important niche questions, which you know may not always be answered. So overall, I thought this was just an important study that you know gives us a lot to even think about in everyday clinical practice. Thank you very much, uh, Hira, for your nice comments. And uh, I would like to join you again to congratulate uh, Francesca and the whole collaborative group in Italy for conducting uh, this uh, academic trial. And we know very well these days, it's very difficult uh, to run these large academic trials. I think going into the details of the paper, maybe uh, can I kindly ask you to remind our audience about the FORTE trial, because I know you've communicated orally, it has been published, uh, but uh, some people may have forgotten or missed it. So can you please remind us the design of the trial and what was the rationale to include this MRD assessment and of course, I don't need to convince the community about the value of MRD in multiple myeloma. I think it's uh, one of the hottest topic in this field. Thank you, Mohamed. Thank you also here for the nice comment. And let me thank also the steering committee for choosing this paper. So uh, the study was a uh, um, randomized study conducted in newly diagnosed uh, myeloma patients, all transplant eligible. There were two randomization. The first was done at the time of diagnosis into one of three arms for induction and consolidation. So patients receive KRD transplant and KRD consolidation or uh, KRD continuously for 12 cycles 
or carfizomib cyclophosphamide instead of lenalidomide and uh, dexamethasone induction, transplant, and then the KCD consolidation. After this treatment, there was a second randomization for patients who did not progress during treatment between maintenance with carfizomib, lenalidomide, or lenalidomide alone. Carfizomib in the carfizomib len arm was given for up to two years, and then the patients continued in lenalidomide maintenance, while lenalidomide in the control arm was given as a standard of care. The trial showed an advantage in terms of PFS for the KRD and transplant arms, uh, as well as a benefit in terms of PFS for the KR arm over the lenalidomide arm. Excellent. Thank you so much. So uh, here, uh, let's now look into the results. And I would like to get your opinion on the way MRD was assessed in this trial. Because there are always thought personally that they have used flow cytometry, which is of course easily available in many academic centers, but the threshold was 10 minus five. And I think more and more we know that it should be rather maybe 10 minus six, which you can achieve easier uh, with NGS. And I think uh, in the US there is an FDA uh, approved or endorsed uh, uh, technique from adaptive biotechnology, I guess, and maybe in other places uh, it's coming now. And in France, we have a good experience, even a great experience. So what did you uh, think uh, about this? Or maybe, Francesca, you can uh, jump in to uh, clarify this. And by the way, guys, you can also post your questions and comments, and I'll share them with the panelists. Sure. I I I'm happy to start off. You know, I think that as we think of MRD, having some MRD is better than no MRD. So that would be the first important step. So I would say um, whatever test that we can have available, and certainly we're realizing more, so 10 to the minus six may be important, but 10 to the minus five, you know, it's, it's the way we're, how we're evaluating a lot of the trials, even cross trial comparison. So when I look at this trial, you know, I can evaluate this across other trials. Flow cytometry also, um, you know, you don't always need a baseline sample. So from an operationalizing perspective, I can tell you we're having so many of these discussions in Canada about for academic trials, how do we set this up? And NGS, um, although perhaps would be the preferred method, it's not so easy to actually operationalize in the cost associated with it. So, you know, 10 to the minus five flow cytometry um, uh, you know, being done kind of even every six months on this trial, to me, is a, a really clinically relevant endpoint. So overall, I was happy with the um, MRD assessment method, obviously 10 to the minus six. And, you know, you may have had longer sus sustainability of that MRD, um, but certainly we're learning more about that. Super. Francesca, uh, I know the trial was designed several years ago, and maybe things have changed today. Yeah, exactly. When the trial was designed, 10 to minus 5 looks to be fine. Um, we perform NGF because of the reasons that you already mentioned. It's easier. Uh, MRD was nevertheless centralized in one single lab. So the test was uniformly done on all the samples and not in different samples. I think one of the key points was that uh, the investigators and the patient that participated in the trial believed in MRD. And so there is a good compliance also in the MRD evaluation during maintenance that uh, helped us to evaluate uh, all these data on the duration of MRD, which is something that sometimes you, you may not do, but probably needs to be done in the near future if we want to try to apply the MRD prospectively for treatment decisions uh, and uh, and so on. We did MRD um, going to a uh, deepest 10 to minus 6 in a subset of patients. This was a sub, a, um, sub study at the time on about 100 patients. Uh, so unfortunately, these data are available but cannot be applied on the whole sample of the patients. That's the reason why we can't really speak about the potential and better value of the 10 to minus 6 sensitivity it could be even more informative than 10 to minus 5. Now, thank you for this clarification. And I think you mentioned something important to the audience. 
that in this protocol, you didn't adjust the treatment to MRD. Uh, that was, uh, everybody, were, MRD wasn't used as a, an indicator uh, for treatment. So then now let's look into the parameters that you have identified as risk factors, or I would say predictors of unsustained MRD negativity, which I think is important. And, and the debate is whether uh, having these 1Q abnormalities or amplification, the high-risk cytogenetics, uh, and we'll talk about the circulating tumor cells, maybe simply a reflection of the biology of the disease, or maybe these patients are getting an insufficient treatment and they should be handled differently. What are your thoughts here on this? So I think you've you know you've you've kind of nailed it. This to us is a high risk group getting incredibly fantastic treatment, yet they still remain high risk. So these are probably patient population groups that we may need to think both different monitoring strategies as well as different you know therapeutic strategies. So when I looked at that paper, I said, you know, even if my patient became MRD negative, but if they had kind of chromosomal one abnormalities, Mm, maybe I need to follow it more closely. Maybe I need to do more imaging more frequently because that's a patient where perhaps even that one time point MRD negativity may give me false reassurance when they're actually at harvest for progression. So it's both about the monitoring strategy and as well about, you know, that even with these fantastic, uh, you know, carfilzomib based induction and potentially dual maintenance, these are the patients that perhaps we we do need better therapeutic options. So I kind of, you know, came out with two conclusions, both about the monitoring as well as the treatment. And, and it was great to see this, the chromosomal one subgroup come out because again, we're learning more and more about this, the, the, this subgroup as being high risk. Excellent. So I, I think this is an important remark, Francesca. And again, I think we have to put the protocol in the historical perspective because you have monitored very closely and elegantly these 1Q abnormalities. And historically, actually, they were not considered as part of the high risk. This is something of recent interest because we would usually uh, speak about translocation. But um, so what was the idea when the protocol was designed to go into uh, the uh, 1Q abnormalities and uh, gains? Was based on initial reports on a potential difference in the prognosis. Uh, so basically all the data, again, the fish was analyzed centrally for all patients and was performed in the same way for all patients that sent the samples. And we had the information of the number of copies as well as on all the specific abnormalities. Uh, so these data were available for the majority of the patients. So this was basically sort of post-hoc analysis that we did later on considering the increasing evidence of the different prognostic roles of the gain versus the amplification of the 1Q. And in the study, basically, uh, in all the analysis that we did, uh, it was quite clear that uh, the poorest outcome is for the patients with the amplification. There is an impact for the gain, but it's sort of intermediate uh, uh, prognosis. Thank you. Uh, Hira, are you looking routinely for uh, 1Q, 1P abnormalities these days, or are you still doing it in a traditional fashion with deletion 17 and translocation for 14? I would say probably most of Canada about two years ago switched to have that in our panel. So, you know, it's all my newer patients diagnosed in the past two years um, that if we're repeating fish, um, that we're testing for those abnormalities, but it's really kind of within the last two years. And it's just, again, with this increasing data saying that we really need to look at this, uh, I think it's important to have that really as part of all uh, myeloma panels now, because we are, again, becoming aware of its importance. Uh, in Again, studies like this really help that. Excellent. Okay, great. And by the way, I'd like to mention that uh, uh, the IMS, International Myeloma Society, 
has done some great job uh, in the last few months about bringing a harmonization of the definition of high risk. So we are eagerly awaiting uh, this publication and consensus. Uh, and obviously, uh, 1Q gains and applications are included uh, as part of this uh, consensus. Now, French, the circulating tumor cells. And this is not something that is done routinely. And on one hand, I would say, why don't you use this as an MRD predictor, you know, simply, and avoiding uh, the uh, bone marrow um, uh, aspirate uh, a repetition for the patient? Well, again, this was a sub-study initially, initially in, this, in trial, but done on the majority of the patients. Uh, there is just one time point that is the baseline evaluation. So it has a prognostic impact on the uh, on patients with rich MRD negativity, but probably is, I believe, at least a marker of aggressive disease, uh, bad prognosis. And that is probably one of the reasons why these patients with uh, circulating tumor cells uh, uh, detected by flow cytometry. Here, the sensitivity is 10 to minus 4, so it's even less than the one for MRD, uh, where uh, patients with poorest prognosis. Unfortunately, we didn't have a monitoring, we didn't have a monitoring, a continuous monitoring during treatment for these patients to see if also changes in the circulating tumor cells could be a marker of, uh, let's say, different prognosis. Thank you, Francesca. Same question to you, Hira, because uh, again, uh, usually patients, they don't like bone marrow aspirate, and especially if you have to repeat them. Uh, uh, I want to move a little bit beyond what we mentioned, discussed about uh, MRD evaluation by flow or by uh, NGS. And maybe if you can give us uh, a short uh, uh, summary of what is the current status of mass spec? Because obviously this is non-invasive. I know it's not conclusive yet, but any thoughts on this? So, I mean, I feel quite hopefully hopeful about mass spec because, you know, we already know that compared to our traditional methods, it's more sensitive. You know, we still, it's not probably still at the point of bone marrow MRD assessment, but hopefully it will move closer and closer towards you know, to that time point. Again, you know, there's different types of mass spec. For some of them, you, you know, you always really need the baseline sample. So again, there's some logistical concerns around how to operationalize that. But, you know, we probably, um, we certainly need a non-marrow test uh, to monitor our patients, um, both on clinical trials and off clinical trials as well, because, you uh, um, doing invasive bone marrow tests, is, it is a little bit challenging. You know, in Canada, we don't have any routine MRD testing at all available. I, I don't know, Francesca, if, if it's outside of clinical trials available to you. I know in the U.S., the Mayo Group has an assay and, and it's perhaps done a bit more, um, uh, perhaps in routine clinical practice, but for us, it's still kind of on trial, uh, not really standardized practice, but hopefully we'll move towards that. No, I agree with you. Actually, there's. I don't believe someone is using routinely for every single patient MRD evaluation. But I must confess that for several patients, we would use it, especially for instance during maintenance if a patient is developing some side effects, and you want to feel a little bit more comfortable or less anxious uh, stopping the maintenance treatment. Well, it would be good to document. MRD negativity and our practice is to rely on NGS and uh, the adaptive technology. But this is, I think, because we centralize everything in Professor Eve Loiseau lab in Toulouse. Uh, Francesca, uh, we have a question from the audience about uh, that maybe we are missing another technique to evaluate myeloma disease, namely imaging, PET scan or MRI. So how did you uh, account for imaging in this study? Because uh, imaging versus MRD, biological MRD, may give different information. 
Yes, so uh, again, when the trial was performed, PET-CT was not so routine in all myeloma patients, and this is an academic study. So it was done in a subset of patients. There is a sub-study, there is a paper published by Elena Zamani looking at the data of the PET-CT and the uh, bone marrow MRD. And that consistently, as in other reports, those patients who were MRD negative by both techniques are the ones with the better prognosis. The point is that here we didn't have a consistent evaluation of MRD by PET-CT during maintenance. So this was left at the investigator decision based on the symptoms. So uh, it is quite different, difficult looking at the uh, so-called pred predictors of uh, unsustained MRT negativity to look at the impact of imaging. We had some data and some patients, for instance, they did not progress in the bone marrow or they progressed in between the bone marrow evaluations with extramedullary disease and were positive for PET-CT, but they had symptoms. So Hira, in your practice, how do you use imaging outside clinical trials to monitor patients? I guess at baseline for sure, but how do you repeat them? So we, again, are becoming aware of the importance of um, having these extra medullary relapse, especially with you know these effective therapies. A lot of times these relapses are happening outside of the bone marrow, and it was so great. And even in the Forte analysis, you know, even patients who were MRD negative, a lot of their relapses, clinical relapses, were actually bony or extra medullary. So we've done a lot of lobbying, at least in my province, and now fortunately have access to a PET CT that we can try to do and follow up as well. So certainly um, for patients that are high risk, um, maybe, you know, I do try to sometimes do a PET once a year, once if there's just any suspicion at all, or even for, for patients, again, who I think are just higher risk, um, I do try to follow it as much as it, it's allowed. Because um, I do think it's it's an important uh, kind of additional information uh, to see where a patient status is at. Okay, thanks. Francesca, we have another question about whether uh, based on your based on other published studies, are you uh, to adjust treatment or to motion? Sorry, Mamad, I think I had some connection problem and was no problem. I, I, get I, 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 I will repeat the question. The question we have from the audience to you is about whether today, based on the results of your study, this blood paper, but also other published studies, whether you are using MRD or imaging to adjust the treatment. So let me give an example. You have a frontline uh, treatment for a patient with, let's say, the gold standard induction, DARA VRD as the Perseus trial, and I think uh, uh, the uh, EMN, which you are part of, uh, has done a great job with this trial, uh, Francesca. Autotransplant and uh, then consolidation and maintenance. And then you do a PET CT, and then you see that you still have one lesion there. How would you handle the situation? And this patient got, you know, state of the art therapy. Well, you know, uh, it depends, actually. <laughs> so if the question is based on PET-CT, I think a lot, uh, um, one of the important things is how the PET-CT is changing. So it is a progressive improvement and the treatment is doing something, then why change? Um, when it's completely negative, the question is, uh, okay, uh, do you need the to stop or may you stop? I think this is the biggest question and one of the biggest potential role of MRD negativity, which will be, can you use the MRD negativity to de-escalate treatment or to stop treatment in a subset of patients? Because we need some, we, we probably have some patients that doesn't need really the, the continuous treatment. Unfortunately, we are not there. 
I think the MRD data based on the PET CT or also on the bone marrow, which however I can't do routinely because it's not reimbursed in my country, uh, may be of help uh, in those situations where well the patient had toxicity, you have to stop. Uh, can you really stop in these patients? How can you monitor the patient in the right way? So this could be of help, even if we can't yet say you can do this based on MRD. Okay, so excellent. So that allows me to jump in into the treatment part. And one unique feature of this trial, uh, it was about that a group of patients received doublet maintenance. Carfizumib, lenalidomide. Obviously, carfizumib may not be viewed as the most easy uh, drug for maintenance, but still, I think we have a proof of concept. Uh, so my question to you, Hira, uh, are we ready for prime time, in a, or is it prime time to move into doublet maintenance in uh, some specific populations, uh, especially, for instance, those guys who are predicted uh, to be uh, to to lose their MRD negativity? I would say, you know, looking at all of the data from a lot of trials, certainly patients who are high risk, and again, it's a ever-changing definition, so some harmonization would be really helpful, they need continuous multi-agent therapy. And so for those patients, you know, what whatever the dual maintenance may be, whether it's DARAV, KREV, I, I would think that you want to keep that pressure on the clone. But I do hope that for the future, we're not doing doublets ongoing continuous therapy on everybody, that we can actually pick apart the patients that need it and don't need it. Um, and, and again, you know, as Francesca said, in this role, how can MRD help us? So let's say if I had a patient who didn't have any chromosomal one abnormalities, they became MRD negative, you know, pre-consolidation, no high uh, to, uh, circulating tumor cells, no high-risk cytogenetic conventional abnormalities, they became MRD negative. Do they need dual maintenance? Would I feel comfortable not having them in dual maintenance? Probably, which would be very different from the converse. Um, and again, even you know, when we think of, I guess, stopping therapy in a subset, whether it's with dual maintenance or not, how long of MRD negativity we need as well. So Francesca, you know, it'd be great to get your thoughts on that as well. Is one year unsustained MRD negative good enough? It seems perhaps not. Do we need it longer? Um, but yeah, so I guess, Mohammed, just coming back to your question, dual maintenance, uh, good for a subset of high-risk patients, but I hope not standard of care for everybody uh, that we can move towards picking out the right patient for the right treatment. Okay, wonderful. So now we're reaching the last few minutes of uh, this journal club. And uh, maybe my question to you, Francesca, and the same question to you, Hira, what's next? Now, what are the next questions you would like to ask if you have the opportunity tomorrow to get an academic grant and run a new trial? Uh, so what are the key questions you would like to ask when it comes to using uh, MRD or assessing MRD or uh, evaluating uh, the role of MRD in, in myeloma to keep on adding knowledge to what we already know? Well, I think one of the key questions here already mentioned, thinking about the optimal duration of MRD negativity that is really needed, that, that is the one that can be a marker or cure, because I think we should start thinking about curing at least a subgroup of patients. Um, so this is something that uh, can be analyzed probably in many, many trials, but we need a really long follow-up and we need to look at the overall survival. Prospectively, I think we need to look uh, at the MRD-driven strategies uh, based on uh, probably escalating in patients who are MRD positive or looking at more intensive treatment in those patients that have some high-risk features with where 
even if they get into MRD negativity, they do not, do not maintain the MRD negativity. So I completely agree with what Hira was mentioning. There are patients you probably don't need to give a multi-agent drug continuously. There are others that it may be helpful, as well as uh, the other key point is which patients you can de-escalate and which patient can stop therapy. So I, I would really like to look prospectively at these questions. That is quite difficult, unfortunately. <laughs> because you need many patients, uh, big trials. The IFM had a wonderful trial based on MRD. Uh, so these, there are some some trials already ongoing. Okay, thank you. And in Canada, Hira, what are the uh, current, what is the current thinking about, or maybe uh, you're running some trials uh, uh, to inform this field and add uh, um, to the body of evidence we have. So certainly, I mean, I would agree with all of those points. I think it's about both the escalation and the de-escalation therapy for the right patient at the right time. And we're getting closer towards it, but there's still lots we need to learn about it. So in Canada, you know, the one trial that we have is the MY13 trial, which is a DARA de-escalation trial. Now, now that's not MRD driven, but MRD, um, you know, will be evaluated at the time of randomization. So we better be able to understand in the future, which patients would have better benefited from de-escalation. But, you know, especially patients, when you ask them, you know, what is cure, they will often answer having no disease and being off treatment. And I think when I think about that, that's the ultimate kind of goal that we want to get to. How can we make them not have really any myeloma with potentially with no with ability to stop treatment uh, also and finding those strategies would be great. Well, wonderful, I think. Uh, I'd like to thank both of you, Hira and Francesca, uh, for this uh, lovely discussion. Uh, I have learned a lot from you. I'd like to thank our audience for sharing uh, their opinion, their questions. I do apologize. We could not take all of them. Uh, but definitely you can reach out to the panelists by email if needed, I think. Uh, again, congratulations, uh, Francesca, uh, for this great work. And uh, I hope uh, to catch up with all of you uh, very soon. Uh, in the meantime, I wish you all, uh, wherever you are, a good day, a good morning, a good afternoon, a good night. Please stay safe and keep well. This is the ICH. Take care.